Hey everybody, thank you for the awesome response to the first video of the Anabolic Anthology series. I put a lot of time and effort into that one, so I'm glad you found it informative. For those who haven't seen it yet, I'll link it below because some of what we discuss is relevant to this conversation. And I'll try not to repeat too much. But some of the key items covered were how steroids exert their effects mechanistically, anabolic versus androgenic activity, and the specifics of testosterone, anavar, deca, d-ball, winstrol, and Trenbolone. Today, our topics by popular request are Masteron, Primobolin, Proviron, NPP, and HCG for good measure. And just like we did in the last video, the best initial step is simply pointing out where these compounds fall. Are they testosterone derived or DHT derived? So Masteron's a 2-alpha methylated derivative of DHT. Primobolin is a 1-methylated derivative of DHT. Proviron is a 1-alpha methylated derivative of DHT. NPP is a 19-nor testosterone. And HCG is a a bit different. It's a glycoprotein hormone that binds the luteinizing hormone receptor. What all of that means we'll get into shortly, but here's a simple little 2D representation of where these different anabolics are derived. Now that I'm in the stages of actually putting this whole thing together, I've realized it's worth redirecting and starting with HCG because as you see, it's upstream of testosterone formation and thus deserves to be upstream in the script. So here's an image of the pathway that takes gonadotropin releasing hormone to testosterone. If you're not new here, the one thing I hope you've learned from me is the notion of negative feedback. It's an incredibly vital feature of hormonal physiology. It's not only at play within every endocrine axis, but we see it in everyday life too. Traffic systems, thermostats, even the toilet bowl, which is a weird example, but you'd know what I mean if you live somewhere that floods and you've got to divert collected water via a sump pump into a toilet that flushes automatically when the water level rises. The point isn't that our body is like a toilet, it's that when there's excess end product, your body down regulates the steps that create it. And inversely, when the end product is low, the upstream signals increase. So let's run through a couple examples using this diagram. What happens if we inject a self-preserving amount of exogenous testosterone? Everything upstream decreases. We've got plenty of end product testosterone, so the hypothalamic pulses decrease. LH and FSH drop, endogenous testosterone production drops. There's no need to make more, which predisposes to testicular atrophy and decreased fertility. Now let's say we've got primary hypogonadism, where the testes are poorly functioning, testosterone tanks. To compensate, LH and FSH rise, trying to signal the testes to produce more. You'd also see increased pulsatility of GnRH, but clinically measuring LH, FSH, and testosterone is usually enough to make the diagnosis, especially alongside present symptoms. Finally, secondary hypogonadism. The problem lies in the hypothalamus or pituitary. LH and FSH are low or inappropriate appropriately normal. Now what happens when we throw in HCG, a luteinizing hormone mimetic? LH is the key hormone responsible for testosterone production, so people often augment steroid cycles with HCG as a way to, for lack of a better phrase, keep the testes active and preserve fertility. We've talked about this in detail before in other videos on HCG. The purpose of including it here is to dissect its anabolic potential. If someone injects a standard dose, it binds the luteinizing hormone receptor and stimulates testosterone synthesis. With continued use, testosterone levels rise, which then provides negative feedback to the hypothalamus and pituitary, decreasing LH and FSH even further. And because we're injecting something that binds the LH receptor, the body senses, I've got plenty of LH, so there's no need to produce more. Which leaves people in an interesting dilemma. You're affecting your hormonal axis, but you're not getting the same anabolic effect as testosterone itself, with the caveat that fertility is more likely to recover if and when you stop. And to clarify here, although HCG can preserve Leydig cell function and support testosterone production, it doesn't fully preserve spermatogenesis without FSH, so fertility support is partial, not complete. From an anabolic standpoint, HCG's effect are mild and most prominent in people who start with low T, which shouldn't be surprising. The research shows HCG is viable for normalizing testosterone in hypogonadal men and improving lean mass they were otherwise avoiding while supporting spermatogenesis, but its muscle building capacity doesn't compare to exogenous steroids. Now let's switch gears. 
Pun intended. Last video, we covered how manipulating testosterone and DHT compounds lets us observe differences in anabolic and androgenic effects, which will come into play shortly, but let's quickly review how steroid hormones work. They diffuse across the cell membrane into the cytoplasm. They bind the intracellular androgen receptor. The steroid receptor complex translocates to the nucleus. In the nucleus, the complex binds specific DNA sequences, which are known as androgen response elements. And then mRNA is translated into protein proteins and enzymes that produce anabolic or androgenic effects. And I'm telling you all this just for completeness sake. I think if people are popularly using compounds, it's good to know at the very minimum how they work. NPP is nandrolone phenylpropionate. It's a 19 nor compound, meaning the 19th carbon is removed, a feature typically used to create a compound favoring anabolic potential. And because it favors anabolism, we see fewer androgenic effects than with testosterone. It's a short-acting injectable ester with a half-life between two and four days, which means quick absorption and rapid peak levels, faster than testosterone enanthate or cypionate. So if somebody were hypothetically prescribed it, it would likely require more frequent dose to avoid volatility. It was once considered for sarcopenia and as a treatment for anemia, but has since been phased out of U.S. medical practice. The key differentiator between NPP and the other compounds we're discussing today is that it's a 19 nor testosterone and also has a short half-life with rapid uptake. Masteron, or drostanolone, is an injectable steroid also with a half-life of about two to three days. It's a 2-alpha methylated derivative of DHT, a slight structural modification that alters how it interacts with the androgen receptor. Functionally, it's anabolic, mildly androgenic, and as characteristic of the DHT family, it doesn't aromatize to estrogen. Remember, testosterone converts to DHT, and that reaction is basically one directional. High DHT can actually suppress testosterone via negative feedback. We've got the end product, we don't need the precursor. Historically, Masteron wasn't designed as a pre-contest hardening agent. It was used in oncology, especially breast cancer regimens alongside anti-estrogen therapies. That's partly why it became popular in physique prep. Lack of estrogenic activity means more of that dry appearance, though with increased risk of sub-estrogenic symptoms like mood changes and joint pain. But because it's not 17-alpha alkylated, it doesn't carry the same liver toxicity risk as Winstrol or Anivar as we discussed in the last video. But not overtly toxic isn't the same as safe. You still get lipid disruption, hormonal axis suppression, blood pressure changes, and androgen-mediated effects like hair loss, acne, voice changes, and virilization. Primabolin, or metanolone, is another DHT-derived compound, this time with a 1-methyl substitution that alters receptor binding and metabolism. It's often described as quote-unquote clean or mild, and while it's milder than most 17-alpha alkylated orals, that reputation is probably more gym lore than scientific fact. We've got the oral acetate form that has a half-life of about 12 to 20 hours. It comes with it poor bioavailability because it's not 17-alpha alkylated, but still carries modest hepatic stress because it's oftentimes taken in high doses. We've also got an injectable enanthate form with a half-life much longer, 7 to 10 days. This typically comes with its steady levels and reduced hepatic burden. Clinically, primabolin historically appeared in conditions involving muscle wasting or chronic illness. Mechanistically, it binds the androgen receptor and drives anabolic signaling with relatively lower androgenic activity than testosterone or endogenous DHT. It still suppresses the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, alters lipids, can cause virilization, and carries cardiovascular and hematologic risks, similar to other steroids, but it does resist aromatization and carries a favorable anabolic to androgenic ratio with tissue selectivity for skeletal muscle and minimal water retention. Finally, provirin, also known as misterolone, is an oral available compound with a half-life of 12 to 20 hours, which is why people often split the dose throughout the day. It's a 1-alpha methylated DHT derivative, but what stands out is its extremely high affinity for SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, which is involved with carry and transport of testosterone. Mechanistically, that means it displaces testosterone from SHBG and increases free testosterone, hence its reputation as a libido-boosting, cosmetically dry agent. But increasing free testosterone 
testosterone isn't the same as preserving endogenous testosterone production. It doesn't. It still suppresses LH and FSH just less severely than most other steroids. That's why DHT derivatives are often paired with exogenous testosterone because DHT can't convert back upstream, and the GnRH to LH and FSH to testosterone axis is still suppressed. Unlike most oral steroids, provirant isn't 17-alpha alkylated, so it's not as hepatotoxic as Winstrol or Dianabol, but it still carries cardiovascular risk, hypertension, virilization concerns, and fertility suppression. It did historically see some use in depressive symptoms associated with hypogonadism and in libido dysfunction with proposed utility in infertility of all things. Some sperm parameters and pregnancy incidence numbers were seen to be improved, but later research found those effects insignificant once steroid-induced hypogonadism was accounted for. Ultimately, for our second anabolic anthology, we've got four different compounds that carry with them significant anabolic potential, less so with HCG, which is not an anabolic agent, and similar risks, varying degrees of gonadal suppression with the steroids themselves and partial axis suppression with HCG, cardiovascular risk, hypertension, hematologic concerns, infertility, and virilization remain shared themes across the anabolic androgenic steroid group. But I hope this helps shed some light on some frequently discussed compounds, and at the very minimum, you gained a thing or two from it. If you like the series and want to see more, leave a comment below. As you know, this isn't my typical area of discussion, but I've enjoyed it and have been learning a lot from you all as well. If you feel so inclined, please leave a like and subscribe to help the channel out. And if you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon available. It's a growing community where we discuss peptide research, people can submit video requests, and it's a communication platform among all else. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can check it out. I've also got a 20-page guide on BPC-157 available for educational purposes, and I've got more coming soon, so stay tuned. Thank you for watching. Above all else, I really appreciate the time, and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.